Herbert's hundred harem. Come on! Some of the girls cheer as the iconic scene with the Power Walker and the Xeno Queen plays out before them. There are cheers as the monster's killed and when the hero and the child escape clean and free. He doesn't have the heart to tell them the next one starts off with the little girl dead and ending with the woman dying to contain a Xeno Queen gestating inside her. You dork! You made us all think that the next two movies were going to be worse, one of his brides says with a smile. Technically, they were, but the heroes were on a better level to match them. Herbert remarks with a bit of a rueful grin. Predator 2, ending with the man being given a prize and straight up jacking the alien tech to fight back, had been a bit of a turning point for the girl's morale, as had the greater hint of the hunter's honor of not attacking a pregnant woman. What about the rest of them? One of the girls near him asks, and he sighs. The quality nosedive so hard that someone must have been drinking in the planning stages. He remarks in a bladed tail with a large pink bow tied to it, drapes over his chest. Yes? He asks the girl in question who's smiling hungrily at him. The deal was we had to watch all four movies to understand, she says, and he nods. We understood after the first one, but powered through all four. Yes, you did he says with a grin. I suppose that means I have to hold up my end of the bargain. So how do you want to do this? What? There's one of me and a hundred of you. If all of you pile on right now, then no one's getting anything and I'll probably get crushed, he says with a grin. He's only been experimenting a little with Axiom in order to sense it all the better. Most of it just flew above his head and confused him. It involved a lot more mental calculations in ways he wasn't comfortable with or all that capable of. Self-empowerment was easy enough, but beyond going from mortal to monster, it wasn't something he could use all that much or all that well, to be honest. But he could tell them apart now even when they wore identical clothing and tried to trick him. There was a little something extra, but for the life of him, he couldn't describe it despite several very wordy attempts to do just that in his reports. Well, we drew lots, she says, and he raises an eyebrow. Ah, so that's what's going on. Did you now? He asks. Let me guess. You're one of the earliest numbers, if not the first. Number two. Hijika has run off to get everything ready, she says, and he chuckles. So how's this going to happen then? Groups of two? He asks. To start, I apologize. We rushed in and nearly broke you the first time. We're going to take this slow. Figure out your best touches as you figure out ours. We're going to straight up seduce you. She all but purrs at him. He raises his eyebrows at the idea. You know that normally comes before the marriage. We got a little turned around. Now go get something you can move in on that looks good and run a comb through that mess you call hair. We're going out. Excuse me? He asks, blindsided by the command. Hell, he expected an order more along the lines of baby oil and a ball gag than fashionable exercise clothing. Did you think we were brainless sex monsters or something? We're going on a date, she says, and he blinks before grinning. All right, sounds fun. You gonna tell me where we're going or is it gonna be a surprise? I think we'll stick with surprise. She teases him. Just be out by the sunrise door near the end of the hour, she says, giving him a kiss on the cheek. And everyone's okay with this? He asks the room, and there are beaming smiles all around. Okay, then, if you're all sure. There are little waves goodbye, and he heads to his room. There's no reason to think that anything's going to go wrong, which means he should load up for light recon work and put those modifications he'd been sewing into his clothing to the test. If he's caught, he'll blame it on paranoia for being out of cruel space and the last time that he'd stepped into someplace he wasn't sure he was welcome. Basic undergarments and black slacks go on first. His combat boots go on next and he hides a K-bar in the left one, and a gun he's personally made based on a compact Sig Sauer design in the right. Ten rounds in the magazine, one in the chamber for eleven shots total. A button-up shirt in dark blue and a black vest, 
The vest he's sewn several pockets along the inside that close with simple buttons. He slips another magazine in each of the four. 51 shots and a combat knife in case things go horribly wrong. Hopefully it's enough. He makes a weedy 14-year-old. A quick few passes through his short hair with a comb leaves it all looking too straight for his liking, so he shakes his head a bit and nods at the look in the mirror. Some formally dressed kid ready for a night on the town. He turns around and there's no sign of the spare magazines. They'll need a scanner to catch him, but since most weapons are laser or plasma, would they even look for kinetics? Well, maybe rail guns or mag rifles if they're common enough to be scanned for, but not ones with chemical-propelled rounds. He's the first to arrive at the Sunrise Door, so named because it opens directly to Sunrise Way, a major thoroughfare that goes along numerous parks on the large tiers of the massive city. He checks his communicator and the time nears what he was told. You were waiting, but what about... You know what? Never mind. One of the girls says, drawing close, and he raises an eyebrow. What did you expect? That I'd need a half hour to work up the courage? I'm fine. He says, and she tilts her head before smiling. Of course you are. You're our tough guy after all. She says, swaying up to him, and then seeming to think better and stop. So where are we going? He asks her, and she simply smiles. You'll see is all the answer he gets and she taps a finger to her lips to signify that she won't be saying anymore. Nine other girls show up before she nods. Ten on one? You really think I can keep up with all of you? He asks with a grin. It's more to keep you safe as we go to some actually fun places. One of them remarks and he scoffs. Keep me safe, right? He says, and there's some giggling. Well, big man, let's see who needs whose help before the night is over. The nearest girl taunts with a smile, and he just smiles back. Later that night, Herbert cursed under his breath as he knocked the table over to give them all some shelter. Some gaggle of crazy bitches with black cloth tied over their eyes had started shooting plasma and blue lasers into the air, destroying the speakers for the dance floor above them. And things had actually been going well, too. The dancing was fun. The food was only plain and not bad. And since he was always with at least two of the girls, if not five of them, no one had really been bothering or patronizing. Hell, there had even been a dater's discount. Stay down. If they can't see you properly, they can't shoot you properly. He hisses to the girls as his gun comes out. He goes through a check of it lightning fast to make sure for the third time today that it was in working order. It is. He's armed. We're here for the demon. This one has been separated from its pack and will be disposed of properly. So says the sightless sisterhood of spawn slayers. One of them shouts and he raises an eyebrow to glance back at the girls. They look as baffled as he feels. We know there's a human here one of the wretched, null-drenched horrors from beyond the light of the stars and the embrace of Axiom. The speaker screams out again and Herbert rolls his eyes. He pulls out his communicator and holds down the red button. It gives out a slight crackle. What's the emergency? Can be heard from the other side. Some group of crazies thinks humans are demons and they're on the hunt. I'm on Tarabi Spire Level 16, a dance club called the Thrill Temple. It's vaguely religion-themed in here. Four hostiles, all identifiable by black cloth around their eyes, all carrying an assortment of plasma and laser weaponry. We got a cat, two wolves and a green girl with antenna, axiom abilities expected but unobserved. Possibly more hostiles. Over. Confirmed. We have a small group nearby. They're coming in to back you up. How many civilians are there? A lot, they shit! Herbert dodges a plasma burst while also pulling one of his girls out of the way of the blast. His communicator is dropped and he has to move in order to draw the fire away from civilians. Corporal Jameson? Corporal Jameson, respond, damn it! The dispatcher on the other end of the call shouts out before the communicator is grabbed by one of Herbert's brides. This is Lula. I'm one of his brides. He's a little busy. You bitches are bulletproof. 
I need a bigger gun. Herbert roars in frustration as a round shatters the clothing of one of the cultists but doesn't so much as draw blood. Okay, then I need you to work with me. How many civilians are there and do you see any more potential enemies? The dispatcher asks, adjusting their tone for the civilian teenager, and Lula lets out a gasp of horror as Herbert barely dodges a plasma blast. The heat leaves his skin red and raw-looking as it burns away a good chunk of his sleeve near the elbow. The concussive bangs of his tiny weapon are somehow just as intimidating as the blasts of light and thermal detonations of his opponents. Lula! Help's on the way! But the more they know, the better a job they'll do. How many civilians and how many hostiles? The dispatcher protests to try and get some answers out of the girl. How is he dodging lasers? Lula demands in shock. Focus! How many are there? The dispatcher all but screams at her and she flinches before focusing her axiom sight much higher than normal. Four shooting. There's two more not shooting. I don't know why. It's packed in here, but everyone's trying to crawl away. Lula explains. The two not shooting are trets. Good. That's the smart thing to do. Get down and stay down so stray shots don't get you. Behind some cover is best. Help is nearly there. The dispatcher orders. Oh, and take care of this communicator. You'll be able to give it back to Herbert soon enough. I'm sure he'll be grateful. We won't let the galaxy be twisted by unholy monsters. They call as one as they loose another volley at Herbert who rolls to the side and braces himself against a knocked-over table. He then takes a much more careful shot than before. One of the plasma rifles bursts near the containment unit and starts venting a plume of flame even as it's dropped. The sheer burning heat shooting from its casing causes the weapon to spin and bounce, offering a wonderful distraction to the now-delighted Herbert. After all, those crazies might be bulletproof, but their weapons weren't. A second careful shot slams into the side of a laser's barrel and its wielder instinctively pulls the trigger. The barrel melts into useless slag and the world is reduced to pain and momentum as a freight train's worth of axiom slams into him. He rips at as much of it as possible to protect himself as he goes through the back wall at a downwards angle and digs a round furrow through the meter's thick platform. Ah, oh, fuck! He grunts as he staggers out of the trench his carcass carved into the concrete and metal with blood dripping from his nose and leaking from around his eyes. Despite his defense, it felt like someone had stuck his guts in a blender on puree after shoving a bowling ball into his skull. You fight well for a monster, but it is the duty of the sightless sisters to see those such as you slain. A voice says above him, and one of the blindfolded idiots he had dismissed due to a lack of weapons floats right above him, with another floating up by her side as he notices the other four stomping out after him. Monster am I? You're the ones who brought terror this night. He spits back mostly to buy another moment or two to figure out a plan. We are here to free those girls from your wretched grip, you false tret thing. She spits out before there's a scream of rage from inside the Thrill Temple. His girls come rushing out and slam into the sightless sisters, tail blades blazing with axiom pining them to the ground and slamming the tail blades either through the weapons or right in front of their faces. Then they're blasted back by the axiom adepts who then deflect a flurry of bullets from Herbert and stopping his charge with knife mere inches away from her stomach. He grunts and growls as her sheer power holds him still in midair. One uses her power to keep everyone else away, as the other focuses Axiom into a physical blade glowing brightly that she grasps with both hands and holds over Herbert. Then her hands explode, followed by both a cratering in the platform and the thundering bang of a sniper rifle. Herbert drops to the ground and finds his balance. Her scream of utter agony distracts her double who turns just in time for a 40mm grenade to catch her in the side. Her shield is strong but the blast still sends her staggering. 
Herbert takes the opportunity to pull at the surrounding axiom and focus it into his gun even as he slots another magazine in. Something in his mind clicks. His shot traces a wake of power through the air, and the right arm of the adept is reduced to so much chunky salsa. So what took you guys? Herbert asks, staggering fully upright and stretching. The troopers rushing in slow down a touch and chuckle. We took the scenic route. The man with the grenade launcher notes even as he slots another explosive shell into the launcher. Bring any souvenirs for me? About 40 millimeters of fuck you to be delivered wherever it's needed. My favorite, who's on the big gun? Any special names? A nerd, Robert Mason. Probably for the best these bitches have been, ga, Herbert says before his adrenaline crashes and the utter agony that his torso's been reduced to hits him like a sledgehammer. Someone call an ambulance, he says as he falls to his hands and knees and struggles to keep his heart rate and breath even. Hold on, buddy. You're going to be fine. The grenadier assures him, and he nods as he takes deep, measured breaths despite the urge to gasp and choke.